Happy Friday morning, folks, family, friends, loved ones, enemies, frenemies, wizards, witches, muggles, mudbloods. Welcome to another episode of Disguise Coverage, the only podcast in existence that gives you an equal amount of blueberries in each muffin. We have a special episode for you, which I hope you have gathered because someone might be thinking, wait a minute, Disguise Coverage is live every Wednesday at 7 p.m. One, this show is not live. It's pre-recorded. Two, it's not a Wednesday at 7 p.m. This is live on a Friday morning. What is going on? I'll tell you what's going on. Night one of the draft was the night before. It's weird talking about this because I'm like talking in future tense, even though like right. everything I'm just happened like, in the past. Yeah. So peek behind the curtain because we're very tired. It is very late into Thursday night slash early Friday morning for myself and Mr. Kendall Mursky, who has joined me here on this special episode of Disguise Coverage. But as I hope you would have known by now, if you heard the news or watched the draft, the Buffalo Bills made a pick in the first round last night of the 2022 NFL Draft, and they took corner, Kair Elam, out of the University of Florida, with the 23rd pick, not the 25th pick, because they traded up two spots and used their fourth round pick to do so. But we'll talk about that in a bit. So we have a first round pick. It's at a position of need. It's at a position that several of us have been banging the drum for for the past two off seasons, a position that we wanted upgrades in free agency and in the draft last year and did not really get a position we wanted reinforced in free agency this year, but did not get. But Brandon Bean gave some insight into that in his presser uh, this past evening, which we are going to talk about. But on the surface, Kair Elam, big Strong on the field, not in uh, hmm. testing numbers, which we're going to go over, but big, strong, fast, athletic, long-ish. Ticks almost all of the proverbial boxes that once the season ended, everybody in Bill's Mafia were clamoring for. You know, mm -hmm. no disrespect to Levi Wallace, but it was all, no more of this. We need a bigger corner, a faster corner. We need more athleticism. Kyrie Lum, in theory, ticks those boxes and Kendall before I kick it to you just in case everyone doesn't know from the title of this episode or seeing you know the the graphic there on the bottom saying breaking down Kyrie Elam what Kendall and I are going to do is we are going to dive into Kyrie Elam tonight advanced metrics numbers stats the tape that we have reviewed and broken down and put it all together to give you more of an in-depth look at who Kyer Elam is, who he was mm -hmm. at Florida in his career there, and who he can potentially be for the Buffalo Bills and what it all means. So Kendall, overall thoughts on this selection. It's a corner. Hooray. It ticks that box. Mm -hmm. Is it the right corner? How do you feel? So initially off the bat, I, I didn't think it was the right corner. And, and I think now that the dust has settled, I'm starting to wrap my brain around why he could be the right corner for the mm -hmm. Buffalo bills. Uh, in my mind, he's, he's my corner seven, just going based yeah. off the tape and the tape alone. Um, he was my corner seven behind McCreary Gordon. And yeah, those, those were the only two guys that were still available at that spot or, and booth too. I forgot to mention oh, booth. Right. and the thing with booth, obviously he was my favorite of all the corners that were available. The mm -hmm. thing with booth obviously is the medical side to things. So yeah you don't know how much that pushes him down that okay. board. You you just don't know. It's it's something we're not privy to. And furthermore, I'll get to it. We don't know the character side of things. We don't know if he checked that box in terms of who he is as a person underneath the helmet. Yeah. So when you look at all of those factors and you hear Bean talk about how Kyer Elam is the last first round grade on their board mm -hmm. and all of that stuff, it starts to contextualize why this pick makes sense for the mm -hmm. Buffalo Bills. I think a big part of it is the fact that he's only 20 years old. He'll be 21 May shortly 5th. in the next, yeah, May 5th coming up. And, you know, 21 starting then and where he is now, there's a lot of room to grow. Yeah. But like I said, given the tape, I, I only watched 2021 tape. I know you watched 21 and 20 tape mm -hmm. for him. I'm excited tomorrow morning I'm going to be waking up to watch his 2020 tape, but just going off of 21, you know, it was, I was lukewarm on it. You mm -hmm. could see, you could see flashes, man. You can see where that athleticism, his testing, I'll pull up his RAS score. Now okay. his testing, you can see the athleticism. It pops at times. Everything and there are other that times, on paper, no disrespect. Again, everything on paper that Levi Wallace is not. 
Yes, exactly. exactly. Or Dane, even Dane Jackson, who I, I still like a lot, but Dane Jackson is not as well. Exactly. And you see the athleticism there and what it could be coupled with everything we have in this coaching staff, what we have from everything we've had in these players, you know, Dane Jackson, Levi Wallace, the two safeties, everything. It all comes together, that coaching plus the athleticism. Just imagine what you could get. And that's that's what's really, really intriguing to me about Kyer Elam, even with you know me feeling lukewarm on his 2021 tape. But what really puts it all together is hearing Bean talk about who he is as a person, the character side to things, and who he is underneath that helmet just screams culture fit the way he talks about him. A quote I pulled from the Bean presser, uh, he was talking about Kyer Elam, obviously, and he says, culture is important to us, and that's why we put him in the first round. And to mm-hmm. me, that spoke, it resonated with me because I view Kyer Elam as a high-end second rounder. I think he is mm-hmm. right on that cusp between first and second round. That's where I evaluated him. I think if he's getting drafted, it's got to be tail end of the first round if he's going on day one. And if he's going on day two, I think he deserves to be a first half of the second round kind of guy. Yeah. And for Brandon Bean to say culture is important to us, and that's why he was a first rounder for us, that tells me the the culture fit, the character thing. That's what pushed him over the edge into a first round prospect for the Buffalo Mm. Bills. So all of that coming together makes me feel a lot better about bringing him in versus my personal favorite who is on the board, Andrew Booth. That's what that's what makes me start to wrap my head around it and get happy about it. And yeah, let's not forget. We finally did it. The bills drafted a corner. We did it in round one. We did it as a fan base. We got to Brandon beans head. We have real estate in his head. And he said that he said multiple times, like, you know, I've been, I've been hearing it loud and clear. We need a corner. Yeah. My neighbors, I hear from, but he even made the joke. Like, you know, I'll sleep better at night now. Um, which was, I, I thought was funny and pretty transparent, uh, transparent of him. But you, you know, I, I think you hit on the nail on the head. You hit the nail on the head for the most part. You can tell that it's like super late as we like stumble over our words here. <laughs> um, I, you know, same. I, my description of Kyrie Elam's 2021 tape all off season because I had multiple people ask me because pe- people saw the physical measurables like on Twitter or in episodes. I DMs. I would get people who. Yeah, would people reach out. Loved him. Yeah, and people or, or they were inquisitive. They'd be like, Yes, you know, I hear you talk about Booth and Mick. My my two favorites, you know, not not who I think are the two best, my two favorites in this class were McDuffie and McCreary. And people, you know, I hear you talk about McDuffie and McCreary and then Booth and then Gordon and then Stingley and so mm-hmm. like, what about Kyrie Elam? What the guy getting Elam? left out. What yeah. about Kyrie Elam? And my thing to everyone was the same. I literally, like, you can find it in if you search my name and Kyrie Elam on Twitter, my response to everybody is I'm I meh. M E H. That's what I've said for everything. I didn't, mm. I didn't love his tape or like him. I didn't dislike him either. I was just meh. There was, I found myself watching him and I'd be like, oh, okay. And then I'd be like, oh, oh okay. Oh. And even when he was doing like good, I wasn't like, like when I, when I watched McDuffie, when I watched Gordon, when I watched McCreary, those are, you know, Gordon's in there for like one of my, you know, favorite guys. Same thing with Booth. Um, mm. And, you know, because Stingley and Saucer in the, their own tier. But when I watched a lot of these corners, like a lot of them, those guys who I really liked, like I was watching multiple games of them because that's what I do for sample size in order to build a proper evaluation. Right. But then also as a person who enjoys football, I'd be like, oh, sweet. Like I want to watch another Kyler Gordon game. And I click that tape up and I'm ready and good to go. I finished the Alabama game first for Kyer Elam. And then I was just like, I don't really want to watch another one. And then I was like, but I'll watch. And not because it was bad. I was just like, meh. Yeah. And you you see some of the pieces. You see, you know, and as we go into this episode, you know, right now, again, we're giving our overall thoughts. We are going to go into his strengths, his weaknesses, and who he is as a player um, overall in, in a variety of ways and really fully break him down so you guys can fully get a grasp of who this player is from a college perspective and how his game translates and who he can be. But what – makes me feel better and what will help me sleep tonight besides the fact that I'm going to be exhausted I'm going to pass out what helps me sleep better is like you said the the physical tools that he brings what he has mm-hmm. in his toolbox the traits that he brings and his skill set as well the things that you cannot teach right 
And so his success, he's he's the type of player for me based on what I saw in 2021. And again, to your point, the 2020 tape is much, 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 much better. He is a different player seemingly in 2020. There's a lot of things that were going on in Florida on and off the field uh, in 2021. Some of those things manifested onto the field. It resulted in some play uh, or some poor play for a lot of the team. I do, but I just can't discount 2021. Like I just can't right. buy the argument that like, well, his 2020 tape is great. So he's going to be that guy. You don't know, especially mm-hmm. because 2021 is the most recent season. What if 2020 was the mirage? What if who he was in 2021 is who he is mm-hmm. like there's, you can make a case for either side, but what's nice is knowing in 2020, you saw a corner that was a very, very strong looking prospect. Right. And so you, right. you think, okay, he's got that in him. Right. And we're going to talk about, you know, what he did well in 2020, because he did some of those things in 2021, but he's a guy who, because of that inconsistency, I think whatever team he goes to is going to be tremendously important. He needs to go to a team that has a good track record of developing corners and secondary players. And lo and behold, where does he go to a team like the Buffalo bills who, when they took Tredavious white in the first round, all those years ago, how many people, how many people, when that happened, were like, Oh, Dude's going to be an all pro corner. How many? Right. Probably not a lot. How many people saw Levi Wallace picked up as a UDFA and were like, that dude's going to be a starter for multiple seasons. How many people saw Dane Jackson as a seventh rounder and were like, that guy's going to contribute meaningful snaps to the number one DVOA defense in football. How many people saw Micah Hyde get signed and were like the punt returner and slot corner from green Bay is going to be a safety full time. Okay. All pro Jordan Poyer. I- go ahead. I think the cool thing about all four of these guys that you've just brought up every single thing you're talking about, it's like when they talked about it, given draft or free agent acquisition, whatever it was, obviously the two safeties, Levi Wallace, Trey white, Mm. when they were talked about, there's trying to share the positives, share the strengths of these players, what they could possibly be, but there's no guarantee that they actually turn into them. And with all of them, it actually came to fruition. That's wild. You, know, you talk like I remember thinking back on the the UDFA signing of Levi Wallace, and everyone was like, "Hey, he was he was good at Alabama. You know, he mm-hmm. had some production there. Like, there is something here. Uh, a lot of people talk highly of this guy. Mm-hmm. He could really make something of himself. No one expected him to actually do it, and he did. That's rare. And it speaks to the coaching every, staff. Yes, it does. And when, especially when you. When it again, I, I talked about the film sample size, right? If it happens once or even twice, you can still be like, Yeah, well, like even a blind squirrel finds a nut. It happened with a lot. Even Taryn Johnson, for my money, is one of the best nickel corners in mm-hmm. all of football. Yeah. How many people in the Bills took Taryn Johnson in third round? Right. Were like, Oh, pff, dude's going to kill it. Dude's going to be sick. They have a projection pick. Exactly. They have a tremendous track record. So now you take this guy who this is a a staff that has been, I keep using this phrase that has been squeezing blood from a stone when Mm -hmm. it comes to these late round and UDFA um, and, and cheaper quote unquote free agent signings that they've been using to patchwork corner two for the last several years. Mm -hmm. And that's where the the argument had shifted a little bit coming into this draft because you had the, the proponents on one side of the fence, which were like, yeah, but look how good the Bills defense has been without having, you know, high investment put into corner two. You can stay on that train and you can be fine. And then the other side, which I was more of a proponent of, was, yeah, look what they've gotten from these late round and UDFAs. Imagine what they can get if they actually invest and go in. Like, comparing it to, like, if you have this chef who's making a really good meal with low quality ingredients, no disrespect to these players, but with lower quality ingredients, mm-hmm. imagine what meal he can make you when you give him high quality ingredients or a better kitchen or better cooking utensils, like whatever have you. Mm-hmm. Imagine how good that meal is going to be. And Elam's tape, I wasn't a fan of, but from an overall blood from a stone, you know, ingredients perspective better (laughs) he's got the ingredients he's got the size he's got enough length he's got the speed he's got athleticism he's got all the things that you can't teach and so now you put him into a team that can help him understand alignment better 
and mm-hmm. hand usage and increase his mental side and the understanding of how you want to play and what you want to do and set him up for success because they have a track record of setting players up for success and getting the best out of them. It's so cliche, but it's not a cliche at any point. You know, come to Buffalo to be the best version of yourself. It's happening and all ha- the time now. It's happening literally all the time. And what, what I, why I had Elam is seven is I thought his floor, his I think he had legitimately had a high ceiling. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't think that was ever in question, but I thought he also had somewhat of a lower floor because of the inconsistency and some of the things that we didn't like on tape, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But if you go to a team that has a track record of getting the best out of players, that means that he has a higher chance of hitting that ceiling. And I think that's what's tremendously exciting, like, and why I think this pick could work. Like, again, I, there were other corners I preferred because I thought they had a very similar ceiling also coupled with a higher floor or a better mm-hmm. scheme fit, different things here and there. But for as bad as, you know, the 2021 tape may be in a variety of ways, he's going to a situation where he can succeed. And what I also think is very interesting, you had this point before we got online tonight. Mm-hmm. He's brought in to be corner two to play opposite of Tredavious White. Like he, I think a I think you and I, and maybe like a lot of us, because I'll, I'll speak for myself here, because when you said that, it kind of like dinged. I was looking at him from the perspective of like, I don't know why, but like a corner one, like whoever we took in round Same. one, I was looking at like, can they be a corner one? And that's what I kept like thinking and thinking and thinking. And then I was like, he doesn't have to be a corner one. Like no. he doesn't, same thing if the Bills would have gotten a receiver, like, oh, Chris Olave, like a lot of people were like, yeah, yeah but he's probably just going to be a high end too. And then I was like, well, that's awesome for the Bills because they got Stephon Diggs. I'll take a high end too. They also have Gabriel Davis. So you're telling me mm-hmm. I got two wide receiver twos and then a wide receiver one? That's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Like Kyer Elam, Kyer Elam right now is the weakest link. If he starts, is the weakest link in the starting secondary. But he's a traitsy, toolsy, weak link that can then be coached up. Like that's the lens it has to be looked through. He's being brought in to play corner two, and it changes that perspective given the tools and the traits that he has combined with a coaching staff that makes you the best version of yourself. Yeah, I think we both got ourselves in trouble a little bit as we were evaluating Mm -hmm. all of the corners, just holding them up to that pedestal where it's just like – you know, what is Trey White going to be? Is he going to get back in time? Like we need a CB one. Do we trust Dane Jackson to be that CB, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And you start evaluating them in a way where it's not truly fair to them as rookies, someone who's going to be picked at pick 25, I guess now pick 23, but either way back into the, the first round, these aren't guys you should be depending on like that. And luckily, even with the way that Brandon Bean was talking about it in the presser, you know, Dane isn't going to just fold over his job. Elam's got to earn it. But the point being, I think we evaluated him a bit too harshly in the scope of he's got to be ready right away. Uh-huh. He is around one corner. He's around one player. So I'd like him to be ready right away. Uh-huh. But I think we were a tad too harsh on that where we should start be, we should start comparing him to Levi Wallace more as a Levi exactly. Wallace replacement, not a Trey white replacement. He's a Trey white um, band aid. I guess that's the best way yeah. to put it, you know, potential three, stop four gap. week band aid stop gap, but he's truly being drafted as the Levi Wallace replacement. So that that's probably the best way to start contextualizing it for us and anyone that listened to us through yeah. this pre-draft process, listened to us kind of poo poo on Kyrie Elam okay. this whole time when, you know, maybe we just overlooked him because we were, we were just too harsh in our evaluation and now we were holding him up to Trey white. I think that's fair. Like, in terms of like what the expectation is and what level of performance you set relative to others at that position, whether currently in the NFL or, or, or other pros, other prospects. And mm-hmm. Elam is, you know, as we start to move into talking about what he does well, Elam is a corner who is very much into that mold. You know, I know you're a fan of this, the whole rock, paper, scissors analogy. Kyrie Elam is in that mold of a corner who allows you to play rock, paper, scissors and throw rock, paper and scissors his he can function in zone he can function in man he can function in press man he can function in off although i know you and i both you know kind of see it similarly from the 2021 tape of how he functions in off coverage which is 
much different again than he did in 2020. He seems like right. a completely different. Like his processing and spatial recognition and leveraging in 2020 is much different than it was in mm -hmm. 2021. Um, and you you see a corner who you know, again, as we're going to start to go into metrics and I'm going to kick it to you in a minute for some of that as we start to dive in here, but just on the surface, like Levi Wallace wasn't a corner that you were playing press man with Levi Wallace wasn't again. This isn't to be disrespectful or, or, or disparage Levi, but we're comparing it to what corner, what corner two has been for this team. Like right. Levi wasn't right. that corner that you were putting in press man by himself on a side, right? Even Dane Jackson. I think Dane Jackson is arguably the best tackler on this entire team. Sure. And he's, he's got tremendous zone eyes and he's good in zone coverage. I don't know how holistically comfortable I am leaving him in press man against a variety. No. He, he would be able to function against a very specific body type or archetype of wide receiver in that world. You know, yes. uh, there, there's the film, the Tampa Bay game. Like he's in press man against Rob Gronkowski, like, cause he's good with bigger. Yeah, that'll guys, work. Cause he, boom, that's how it's going to go. But if it's like, Hey, go play press man against Jalen Waddle and be like, no, thank you. I don't want Dane Jackson to do that. I'm not. No, you got to give him space. Got to give him space and respect the speed. Or do you have to put a safety over the top? Mm -hmm. Kyrie Elam is a move towards that scheme versatile world where mm -hmm. we've talked about it so much, especially as the teams play 11 personnel so much and you get these three wide receiver sets. And even with without 11, you still see a lot of three by one sets. And the Bills love yeah. to take that one on the solo side and play man coverage on that guy. Or maybe they'll play man coverage, they'll play Meg, man everywhere he goes, on number one on the three wide receiver side. But depending on the corners that you have, you can't always do that. Okay, like, okay, if say we're always going to make the rule, and okay, we're always playing, you know, man coverage on the one wide receiver side, are we moving Trey over there? Because we have to, because we're not comfortable in corner with corner two doing it? Or, okay, we can put corner two on him, but let's shade Micah Hyde over the top. Kyrie mm -hmm. Elam, if he can reach that ceiling and potential, he has the ability to function in the realm of a Tredavious White in the in yes. scheme versatile piece because he has the requisite size, speed, length, agility, athleticism in ways that other corners have not. Levi functioned very well. Dane has functioned well. But even when they hit their ceiling, it still comes with limitations. Mm-hmm. Kyrs is much different given his skill set and his strengths. And if you had to pin down some of, you know, for you, what are his biggest strengths that you look towards or things you saw, whether that the numbers and the metrics spoke to or things that you saw on film that if you had to point to something, you were like, here are the things that I hang my hat on for what he does well. And I think he'll continue to do well. I want to say press, but I think there are some things he has to clean up and press. So I'm going to speak more in terms of the traits. I, I think his fluidity for his mm. size is special. Like is being six foot one plus one ninety pounds. It's a big corner. Yeah, that's a big corner. You know, longer limbed guys. It, it takes more to be agile, and he does it well. He transitions well for his size out of his back pedal flipping his hips, all of those things, showing reactive athleticism. And then specifically in regards to press, the reason I think he can play press is because he has the recovery speed. If he yes. gets beat, like we'll he get to it. Carry, when we get to it. carry vertically. Like he has that ability to push up field. Exactly. Like I'll, I'll get more into his press technique, but like if he loses in his press technique and someone tries to stack him vertically, it's, it's a typical, it's a difficult task for that wide receiver because He's just got the long speed. Gyer Elam has that long speed to recover. So specifically, specifically the fluidity for his size and the athleticism, the reactive athleticism for his size. I think it's, it's truly special. Mm -hmm. And then coupling that with the size and the length to play press, but also if you get beat, you can recover. I think those are his three best traits. And mm. I should, I should couple in his closing speed, but, I've yet to get to his 2020 tape, which yeah. I know it's, it's much, there, yeah. much better when you see it in off coverage more, because I'm telling you, man, that 2021 tape, it's almost predominantly press coverage. You don't see a whole lot of off coverage from him in 2021. So you don't really truly get to see that skill of closing speed as much when you're already closed in on your guy in press. Very true. And that's something Brandon B noted in his presser after night one of the draft, he mentioned how, um, Elam was in much more uh, press man in 2021 than he ever had been before. And he used that as an example to talk about 
um, some of the decrease in interception numbers for Elam. And he talked about, you yeah. know, when you're sitting there and press man, you're not, it's not like when you're in off zone and you're able to just kind of, or off in general, where you're able mm-hmm. to just sit back and have your eyes on the QB and you can, you know, make reads and plays on the ball. Your back is going to get turned to the QB when you're impressed, man. It's a much more difficult assignment. Um, I do think he has to clean up some things in press man, hand placement, footwork, mm-hmm. overall like alignment and just how to leverage the situation consistently. There are times where he'll jam a receiver and press him to the point that he wins that rep in like a yard and a half and it's mm-hmm. over for the receiver, like done. They got no shot. And other times he's just not clean with his yeah. technique. And in a variety of ways, it could be hand placement. It might be um you know, how wide he sets his feet. It might be what shoulder he shaded. It might be the overall alignment and giving up that inside leverage or, or, or positioning, but his press man, I think for me is a strength because this is something we've, we've noted in, at least for me, that rock, paper, scissors piece, like the bills mm-hmm. play pattern match zone coverage defense, which basically is zone coverage that plays like man. But we also know they play straight up man coverage in cover one and they they'll they'll slice one of those safeties coming up as that robber defender almost and then leave the other you know solo in 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 the middle of the field there's the post safety you have to function in one on one on the outside whether off or preferably for me i want press because i like getting physical with receivers mm-hmm. especially when you've now got a weapon on your defensive line in von miller who can get to the quarterback fast. And you also have a weapon on your defensive line in at Oliver who can also potentially get to the quarterback fast, make the routes take time. Correct. I want to throw off rhythm. I want to throw off routine. I want to throw off the timing and make things dirty and muddy on the outside Mm -hmm. and allow those dogs up front to get home. And him being a functional impressed man is a big boon for me. Like that is, that is a strength because again, I think he's functional in it. And it is one of his strengths, but he is inconsistent up and down. But he goes to a team that makes your inconsistencies kind of fade away. And again, makes you right. the best version of yourself. Mm-hmm. And so that's a big one for me. And you mentioned the athleticism. That that's my other that fluid athleticism. Like you said, like he is he's smooth, he's controlled. There's there's a clip. It, it was my favorite clip of him. You know, they're playing Alabama, which was a bit of a rough game in certain ways up and down um, for sure. Yeah. Up and down. That's actually like a perfect microcosm of like who he is. Um, yeah. He had some really rough moments, which we're going to talk about when we talk about his weaknesses in a minute or areas of opportunity, I should say. But my, he, my favorite highlight of him came in this, in this game. He's one-on-one with Jamison Williams in press man. And Williams tries to like hesitate off the line and make it seem like he's stock blocking or just kind of like, like he's going to do something around the line scrim is like, it's a snap mm-hmm. and he kind of just like hesitates and then, but he does it and kind of drifts inside to set up, mm. to give himself more space to the outside, to the sideline. And then bang, he takes off and Elam slow plays the hell out of it. Does not bite whatsoever on any type of mind tricks or games that Jamison Williams is trying to fool him with. And then he gets his hands on him and he rides him right up the sideline. And it's perfect. Yep. And it's beautiful. It, it, it's everything you want to see, like staying in phase, mirroring matching the hand placement the the calm the footwork everything all in one nice neat package and you can't do all of that easily if you don't have that athleticism and that smoothness to your game at that size you know we i I, i've talked about how smooth and technical roger mccreary is and why i like him he's a significantly smaller corner than Mm -hmm. Kyrie Lam and not to take anything away from a career, but it's easier to be more athletic when you're a smaller guy. It's harder, the bigger you are. He, and this is something I want to talk about with weaknesses as well. Like he's a big guy, but he doesn't look like a big guy when he's playing. Like he moves like a smaller, more agile player. And again, that's something that this defense has not had, especially in the secondary, like Hyde is fantastic. Poyer's fantastic. Trey is fantastic. None of them are like speed burners. None of them are like 97, 98 Madden speed guys. Like Trey is probably the fastest and he's like a 92 Madden speed guy. And then right. Hyde and Poyer are both, both like 86s, 87s, maybe right. 88s. They're not, they're, they're athletic, but they're not holistically fast. They're not tremendously mm-hmm. agile. They're versatile. They're athletic, but their biggest thing is they're all technically sound and they win with technique, which is awesome. But the problem is when you come up against these physically imposing receivers or tight ends or whatever have you, whether it's size, whether it's strength, whether it's speed, 
you can still win with your technique, but your technique has to be so on point because if it's not, you're done. The divisional game against Kansas City, the Tyreek Hill touchdown um, that Kansas City scores with under two minutes right before Josh drives us down and we think the Bills have won the game. (sighs) Tyreek Hill houses that ball because Poyer's angle is off by a hair. Micah Hyde's angle is off by a hair. And when you don't have the speed, if you're off by a hair, you're done. Yep. Granted, Tyreek Hill, who's who's running with him? Of course, right? but you can't make up for it if you Correct. don't have that speed. If you've got some more speed, you can course correct a little bit. You don't have mm-hmm. to be as perfect all the time and on point all the time. And so that's like a big one for me. Like his speed, even though I don't necessarily think that, you know, again, 4-3-9, I don't know if he always played to a 4-3-9 with his game yeah. speed. That's, and that's something we're going to get into a minute, but – there are times when he flashed it and he has the athleticism. He has the agility. He has the fluidity in his game. He injects an aspect to this Bills secondary that they don't currently have. Mm-hmm. And that's a big one, a big, big, big one for me, which is going to get something we've clamored for. And you combine that with the press man, which is part of the scheme versatility piece yes. that we've been asking for, you know, and again, you look at some of his numbers, like, He's, you know, man coverage numbers 2019 through 2021. So he was in man coverage 25.6% of the time in 2019, 24.2% of the time, 2020 and 28% of the time in 2021. And then zone 2019, 61% roughly 2020, 68%. And then 2021, 58%. He's got a good mix and he's seen Mm -hmm. targets and you see the reception percentage in 2020, he allowed a 25% reception percentage when in man coverage. 2021, another 25% reception percentage. Like those are really, really, really quality numbers. And yeah. I think it speaks to his potential and what he can do. But then also on the flip side, there are some areas of opportunity. Ironically, in some of those man zone splits, there are some not so great numbers that uh, we can speak to here as well. But there's also pieces of, you know, of, of his game that need opportunity when you just watch the tape and what you see. Mm-hmm. So for you, what are his biggest areas of opportunity or biggest weaknesses, things that concern you when you either watch the tape or when you dove into the advanced metrics to really piece your evaluation together for him? I think the biggest thing is the run stopping stuff. And and I know you're a cornerback, like you're asked to cover. Your primary responsibility is covering wide receivers. I understand that but you still have to be able to support the run, especially given the way that the uh, offenses in the NFL are trending, you know, the way that you're stressing defenses to play in more too high shells, you have to be able to come from depth and, Uh and help in the run game, especially if you're in quarters or cover four or whatever it is, and you're dropping deep or you're playing it off, you have to be able to come forward from depth Uh and make a play. And that is, I mean, if anyone has listened to us pre-draft or plenty (laughs) of other people talk about Elam, this is like the one thing that really gets highlighted as an area that he needs to improve. And Brandon Bean even mentioned it in his presser. It's just the one area. To me, he doesn't seem willing or aggressive to come downhill and make a play. And that's my Mm -hmm. biggest worry about it. But then on top of that, this is the more correctable thing. Honestly, that's even correctable. You know, that's a mindset thing. You'd start coaching that up and just tell them, Hey, you can be aggressive here. Like you got this guy displacing Mm -hmm. you. You'll be fine here. All that Mm -hmm. kind of stuff. You know, you can coach that, but the more most correctable technical thing is just the missed tackle portion. He's Mm -hmm. had 13 missed tackles in 2020 for 25% missed tackle Mm -hmm. rate. And then in 2021, he followed that up with three missed tackles for 10%, which is an improvement, but I didn't feel like why I feel like that number wasn't real because I watched three games and I feel like I counted more than three missed tackles in the three games that I watched alone. So, and that being said on top of that, he only had four stops in 2021. Like that speaks to the lack of aggressiveness and willingness to come up and fit the run. And 
come up and help and make a play near the line of scrimmage because a stop means that you're either stopping them on third or fourth down from Mm -hmm. getting that first down or on first and second down, you're stopping them from gaining half of the yards to gain to get that. And with playing all the zone coverage snaps that he did, it's not like, oh, well, he was in man and he got taken somewhere else completely. Like he's in zone. He's going to be able to see what's correct. And so the fact that he's not getting any, it either means he's not potentially not giving that effort with that aggressiveness, Mm -hmm. or he's not going in a right way from an angle to the ball and being taken out of the play. Either way, it's not ideal. So I guess specifically to the run support stuff, those are my biggest concerns. Um, I did say that he, he struggles to shed blockers and make plays in that way. Like once he gets blocked up, he didn't seem to show a ton of um, activity to try and shed that block and any sort Mm -hmm. of desperation or urgency to shed that block. You know, he was just content, like, okay, I guess I'm just setting the edge here and Mm -hmm. and I'm just going to man you man this up. Uh, I thought his pursuit angles were sometimes inconsistent. And then I thought this is this is the thing that I was going back to when I was talking about his press stuff, because I do think he translates very well to a press man corner. But I think he's somewhat inconsistent with his jabs. I think he can miss sometimes with those. And that's when you start to see the examples of that recovery speed bailing him out. And this is the thing that I think a coverage is the most glaring need or need glaring weakness for him is sometimes because he's so athletic, he relies on it a lot Mm -hmm. and he relies on it to bail himself out. And as you get up in levels of competition, (laughs) you can't always rely on that athleticism. So that being said, obviously he's got a wonderful bag of traits, bag of tools to work with. And once you refine that technique, you don't necessarily need to lean on that athleticism, Mm -hmm. but it's nice to have that athleticism as a baseline to lean on. Like you said, the Tyreek Hill play, you know, if you have a bad angle, better speed can help you course correct Mm -hmm. for that bad angle. So it's a strength and a weakness, but it is something that I would like to see short up. It's nice to see that confidence. If you're super disciplined in your approach and coverage and you're confident in your athleticism, that is a good thing, but you don't want to be overconfident. That's fair. Um, you know, and the, the tackling piece is a big one for me. And again, like you mentioned, it's something that Brandon Bean um, even even noticed. You know, he he talked about some of the strengths, and he mentioned Kyrie Elam having the high ceiling, playing in the SEC against top competition, being young, yeah. being a bigger, longer guy, having the speed to carry vertical routes, um, his functionality and press man. And then he also mentioned, you know, he felt that at times – his tackling at times uh, was inconsistent, but Elam felt that it was due to what Florida was asking of him. He didn't, Bean didn't elaborate much more than that. But again, I ties into there were some things, whether it was on the field, setting players up for success, or you know things off the field that things just weren't clicking right for Elam, and not even just for Elam for this Florida team as a whole um, this past year. But his tackling, you know, I mentioned the Alabama game. And that's why the three missed tackles in 2021, I think it's a lie. Like he had like five missed tackles in that game alone. And I see missed mm. tackles like bad. Like there's a swing pass to Brian Robinson where that's he just I remember juked too. in the red zone around like the 10 yard line. He Robinson makes the most effortless. Like he just catches the ball in a swing pass and Elam just takes such a poor angle and Robinson just cuts once and Elam just and Robinson out isn't gun. an overly elusive guy either. No, not in open field. He is, he's got good feet and he's got good burst, but he's not like, shake shake juke he's not LaShawn McCoy he's very mm-hmm. much like one foot in the ground and then I try to attack a shoulder so I can run through you mm-hmm. and he jukes Elam so hard he wipes out and that happens multiple times in that game where he just comes up and puts a shoulder and doesn't wrap and a guy runs through him and bounces off him or he comes and just whiffs and misses over and over again and that was something I saw in multiple games from him so the tackling piece concerns me and Yes, I know. I've I've heard other people say, like you mentioned, you know, well, corner's job is to cover. They're not supposed to have to tackle, blah, blah, blah. I don't care, especially in a light box defense like the Bills play. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to play the run as a corner. Things are going to get spilled outside, and you're going to have to make a play. You need to make a play. Mm-hmm. You need to be able to tackle versus the run and just in the pass in general. Like, I don't want to worry about if somebody catches the ball in front of you whether or not you can bring him down. And maybe that's why he doesn't have more stops because it's third and four and he comes up to make a tackle and stop it for a yard short and he misses and dude Mm -hmm. goes forward. Like I do have a concern with the tackling. I also think, you know, as I mentioned on the live show um, Thursday night, 
I think he's grabby in his stems and in, in, during wide receiver stems. I think he's grabby at the top of the route. Um, there were multiple clips that I saw people show where they were like, yo, look at like Kyrie Elam locking down Jamison Williams. And for me, I looked at it and I was like, that's legal contact in the NFL. Like he's not going to get away with that. Like that's grabby. Um, mm-hmm. And again, I think some of that can be corrected. Better, right. better hand placement, better footwork, um, better alignment again. But the grabbiness concerns me for sure. And then even just, again, the overall inconsistency, you know, I mentioned some of the man coverage numbers, right? So in 2020 and 2021, he allowed a 25% reception percentage in man coverage, not a huge ton of targets, but like 12 targets, three catches, like 16 targets, four catches. Yeah. It's impressive, but you still have some ups and downs. And that's so for example, in 2021, again, 25% reception percentage, but his yards allowed per reception were 18 which is huge. So that means when he is getting beat, granted, it's not a lot. He's giving up these big chunk mm-hmm. plays, which in a Bills defense, that does not fly because you have right. to keep everything in front of you, which again right. is also why you have to tackle because you're playing top down. So you're forcing all of that offensive action into the kill zone. And that kill zone is the area where you rally and tackle and make a play. And if you can't mm-hmm. rally and tackle and make a play, that's a problem. Um, so you have that yards per reception in man this past year. And then again, also in this past year, you know, actually, no, I'll kick it to 2020 in zone coverage, right? Zone coverage, which he was in 68.4% of the time in 2020. Yards per reception allowed 16.4, which is, again, a high number, this time in zone, not in man. So, again, a different kind of coverage scheme, giving up chunk plays. But we know sometimes zone coverage, being charged with a reception, you know, maybe that gets a little wonky, wonky skews, yeah. correct. It skews the numbers a bit. Um so that's fine, you know, maybe. But then you kick it to 2021, and his yards per reception went down to 8.9. And you're like, oh, okay, that's an improvement, right? 2021, yards per catch, 8.9, big improvement. You know, cut by almost eight full percentage points from the year before. But his reception percentage allowed was 77.8 in zone coverage this past year. That's wild. Even, that's wild. even if, like things are being attributed incorrectly. Like like we've given the example for linebackers in mm-hmm. the NFL, right? Like a check down to a running back, even if it's not their zone, will get attributed to like Tremaine Edmonds. And then it's like, oh, well, look at the numbers. He can't cover it. It's like, that wasn't even his man or his responsibility. Mm-hmm. But even if you take that into account, right? Even if you wanted to be like, oh, well, you know, it, it should knock off 10 percentage points. He's still at a reception percentage of almost 68% which is wild. And again, I think that speaks to the inconsistency. You've got these numbers, these, when you look at his man coverage and zone coverage splits, either his yards per reception or his reception percentages, one of them goes up, one of them drops. Mm -hmm. One of them goes up, one of them drops. It's this roller coaster-y type of thing. And again, it's like, okay, well, on the one hand, he's showing deficiency in this area, but on the other hand, oh man, look what he's doing potentially. Like this could really work out. And that's what has to be smoothed out. Mm -hmm. And it's a matter of whether or not he can and whether or not the bills can get that best out of him, which again, they have a track record for, but you put those things together. And I think that's part of the reason why you have that shakiness. Again, the 2020 tape speaks a little different, but that 2021 tape is still very valid. And those issues that Mm -hmm. plagued him in 2021 are still present, albeit to a lesser degree, um, in his strong 2020 season. Um, but again, he seems like a good fit for a variety of reasons. One of those reasons, you know, other than the physical is the mental, the culture fit, the culture piece. Brandon Bean was very eloquent and transparent in his presser tonight when talking about Kyrie Elam and why they targeted him and what he brought. And when you're thinking back to that presser, you know, which we listened to right before we started recording this, and then took notes. What what really stuck out to you in terms of like you heard Brandon Bean say, was it one thing? Was it five things? You know, what did overall like just hit home for you when you you were listening and it made you kind of stop and be like, whoa, I need to write that down or put that into my brain when it came to how he spoke about Kyrie. I think the main thing was how he talked about that question that he asked about Trey white, what he, what, mm. how, how Trey white got so good. His eyes lit up when he talked about Elam asking that yeah, question. Exactly. Like how Trey white got so good, like what they saw in him. What did they see in Elam relative to Trey white? What, what did they think Trey white needs to get better at when they drafted him? What do they think that Elam needs to get better at? And immediately beans, like everything in his brain just starts spinning. He's just like, you know what this dude, 
He's wired the right way. He wants to improve. And that's something that's been a trend with everyone really since Bean has been steering the ship here. You know, he's been trying to find guys that are hungry to improve Mm -hmm. every single day. Guys that are their own worst critic, but they're always trying to find weaknesses or like you say, areas of opportunity to improve. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. Like, you can tell Bean truly believes that with Kyer Elam. He's always trying to improve every single day, stacking good days on top of one another. Mm. So that's the biggest thing that got me to wrap my head around this and truly be content with the pick because, yeah, like I wanted Booth, but there's concerns about Booth too. And we mm-hmm. don't know that piece of the puzzle. We don't know the character side. We don't yeah. know the medical side. We just like the tape a lot for Booth. <laughs> We were lukewarm on the tape for Elam, but we don't know the character side. Mm -hmm. We don't know the medical side. And now we're starting to get those pieces filled in for us. And now it's starting to make more and more sense why he's a Buffalo fit through and through. Yeah, Bean hit on several points regarding that. He talked about Elam's DNA and how he's a culture fit. He talked about uh, his first conversation. Their first conversation with Elam was at the Combine. But then they had the interview process and the top 30 visits, and that's when it really solidified things. Like he just he just seemed to tick all the boxes from the culture perspective. And no, I don't this isn't to discount what he offers on the field. Mm-hmm. But like you mentioned, the person underneath the helmet and the guy between the ears, like we know how tremendously important that is to the Buffalo Bills. Like who you are as a professional and who you are as a person and a player is very important to this organization. And I think again, I don't think you can overstate how important it's been in the turnaround of this franchise, like this went from a franchise where everybody'd be like, ha ha Buffalo to now it's a place where people want to come and play, whether they're rookies, whether they're veterans, right. whether they're older, whether they're in their prime, like they he want was to genuinely in. excited. Yes. He, he, got cr- picked. he cried and it was real tears. Like, and he, mm-hmm. then he was pumped after like, it's a big thing to turn around the mental state and cultural state of an yeah. organization and being a McDermott shipped out. Like actually the only people left, I think now that Jerry Hughes is a free agent, I think Reed Ferguson is the only one left from before being a McDermott. Wild. Like Absolutely they turned wild. the whole, it, it's, it's unreal. Like they turned this whole team around and part of it is getting the right guys in. We, we talked about it on disguise coverage on Wednesday when one of the questions that we were asked in that mailbag was, you know, the Jordan Poyer trade piece. And we talked about the locker what, room, exactly the locker room. And not that you, that means you have to keep Poyer, but if you trade him or get rid of him in a way that is less than that, that is less than pleasing to the locker room that makes that locker room start to go like, and we saw that all night last Lamar night, Jackson, all the trades, the Titans, like the Taylor, the one and everyone else who went, they saw happen to go down, going down with AJ Brown. Like mm-hmm. that sours people. Mike quick. Vrabel, Mike Vrabel showing it too. Out, it was weird. Like he didn't know, like, and those things, they may manifest themselves in large ways where guy requests a trade or guy doesn't resign, or it might manifest in small ways. Maybe, this player doesn't practice as hard this week, or maybe mm-hmm. he doesn't try as hard for this half, or he takes a playoff or a series off or all these things. Like and it starts to manifest and then that gets toxic. It spreads the mm-hmm. DNA piece and the culture piece is huge. This organization Elam from his interviews, just, you know, with being and being talking about in the presser just seemed like he ticked all those boxes for the kind yep. of guy that is a person that they want to bring in. Um, I also thought it was really interesting to, that, you know, several, several of the things that we talked about on the live show, you know, being said that they had a good grade on Kyir. Um, he was the last player in the first round who had a first round grade for mm-hmm. them. Um, then he also talked about the cornerback position and said it was one where we wanted to add depth and we looked in free agency too. We also looked last year in the draft, but last year we had to follow our boards And they also Mm -hmm. gave some insight into free agency this year and said they looked into free agency this year, but the guys they were looking at got out of their price range. They Mm -hmm. couldn't do anything about it. So I thought it was interesting for him letting everyone know, again, with those comments earlier of like, I hear everyone, I hear my neighbors, (laughs) like corners and knee, blah, blah, blah. They made a concerted effort this offseason before the draft and apparently last year to reinforce that position. Things just didn't line up. And I thought that was interesting because we've had so many people have been like, they don't care about corner. They don't care. I don't mm-hmm. think that's true. They recognize the need for it. It just didn't fit the value. Correct. Things just didn't align. The same way at the trade deadline every year where it's like, oh, can't believe they didn't make a trade. 
how do you know they didn't call every single team? Right. But the, what the right. teams were asking wasn't reasonable. And so they were just like, well, we're not going to make that deal. But people act like because they didn't make a trade, that means they didn't even pick up the phone. And this is terrible. Mm-hmm. And what a joke. Um, and then some other things that uh, being said about Elam. He said Elam is a great fit in our defense. He's got versatility in the sense that he can play off. He can play press. He gives us a little size, length, and then speed if we go press man. He mentioned that a lot. He mentioned the length multiple times. We noted it. The length. He mentioned the press man piece multiple times. Mm -hmm. He mentioned that speed giving Leslie. He literally said like it gives Leslie, you know, some more options and playing press because he can carry guys vertically. Like, so I thought it was interesting that he mentioned kind of like the chess piece and the rock, paper, scissor aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And then there were a couple little pieces as well. um, Because, you know, the Bills traded up from 25. We were talking about it during the episode of the live draft, but. Bean came out and answered it and talked about, you know, they were worried about someone trading up in front of them. So they weren't right. worried about Baltimore or what Dallas was doing. They were worried about someone trading up with Baltimore or trading up with Dallas because they saw the run on corners early. And then Bean explicitly said it. McDuffie went. The second McDuffie. Correct. Went. And that they were like, uh-oh, somebody might jump in front of us. We got to try and get in front. And so they made the move there. But what he also said is there were other players that they would have been comfortable with at 25 yes and he and they didn't that. have first round grades Correct. too Correct. and he said you know there were some guys that we had second round grades on but we would have been comfortable taking them at 25 and also what was an interesting one is he said the way it was going early we thought we were going to move down from 25 he said he when was sauce, actively shopping correct when stingley and sauce went early they thought a run on corners was happening and they were going to trade down which makes me think corner was all the, the way all the end all beat not end all be all but the top yeah. dog priority target going into round one no receiver no running back no mm-hmm. interior offensive line it not corner or bust but it was corner or trade down almost yep. given some yep. of the things that he said and he was really transparent and and he it was, was really cool and i like that a lot and he also mentioned something as we shift towards you know the last topic here in this bonus episode he also said he was asked about um, you know taking other corners this weekend, and he said they if a corner is the best player on the board, they'll take another corner in this draft. And he literally then explicitly said, if there's a really good corner in the second round, we'll take them, which I thought was very interesting. Of maybe we see a double dip at corner with round one and round two again, but set the stage for. Because, again, this is Friday right now when we're recording this and when it's going live. Tonight, we have rounds two and three. We have night two of Mm -hmm. the draft. Let's start to set that stage a little bit for everyone here. What do you expect to see given the Kyer Elam pick, given who's left on the board? What do you think the direction of this team is? You know, how does it all fit? Anything you kind of you're personally looking for or anything you're anticipating as we move towards night two? I truly, truly thought running back was in play in round two. I truly thought that that was what they were going to try to do with 57, maybe even move up and try to get their guy somewhere earlier than 57 in the second round. But the way Bean answered a lot of questions, he he kind of shrugged it off, said, you know, all that Brees Hall stuff. We didn't let that get out. We don't he do also said stuff. He also said something. Oh, I didn't write it down. Like he also said something. Someone said, is running back like a position that you feel you need to come away from this weekend with a a, a draft pick? And he basically, to paraphrase Bean, he was like, no, we don't feel that way. Again, could be smoke screen, even though he says they don't do smoke screens. He says they don't do smoke screens, but exactly. There's gamesmanship to it. It's literally in between the first and second round. You don't straight up tell the league that We're going running back, back is a need for you and there was also another question where he was asked like oh where i think it was running back where do you think that stacks up with your needs and he's like well without going too far into it it wasn't as much of a need yes. as corner and that's all he can share he yeah. he simply can't share more than that or else he's literally bleeding his his hand he, he yeah. can't do that so i truly do believe that I don't want to say he's lying, but he's not sharing as much as he can. He's not being completely forthcoming. Exactly. So I I think running back is in play in round two. Um, Other than that, man, 
they're gonna they're gonna trust the board. Like that's just that's just what they do. And he he said it when he was talking about if a corner falls, if a corner falls and he's top of the board, they're gonna take him. Because at this point, what is the biggest need on the Buffalo Bills right now? You could make an argument for anything, and they're all Good. tied. And I think you know whether it's interior offensive line, whether it's wide receiver, whether it's running back. I'd, I'd argue those are the three biggest needs at this point. Who's to say one's more important than the other? Because they're all pretty close. It's all preference based at this point. So I I truly think he'll just trust the board. But personal preference, I I think he should go running back at some point on day two tomorrow today. <laughs> yeah, right today. Um. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, and he even mentioned, he talked about the double dip last year. He was like, we didn't come into the draft thinking we were going to take mm-hmm. <clears throat> edge back to back and then take tackles back to back. Like we didn't think that it just happened. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I, I, same thing. I think the board comes to him. I still think the next two picks, you know, again, now there's no round four pick. We're going to have to wait a little more yeah. on day three uh, for some action there, but I expect in round two and round three, those picks to come from the running back wide receiver interior offensive line bucket. I, Mm -hmm. I, I, again, at this point, you got to see how the board falls. I I still think they're going to come away with a running back. I feel strongly about running back at 57. If Brees is there or Kenneth Walker is there, I would love to see either one of those guys nabbed. And then the plethora of like day two wide receivers that are still kicking around the yeah uh, Christian Watsons, the Sky Moores, the everyone Alec stopped. Everyone stopped taking wide receivers once. Correct. You know what? Who was the last one? Dotson at sixteen? No, it was probably Burks, Burks at eighteen. Yeah, Burks, and but now you just still stopped. got you've still got Pickens there, like who a lot of people think could be like the top one of the top five guys, and so on and so forth. Like, there's a lot of you got Khalil Shakir. I, I I can't. I should stop. I'm just naming all the receivers that exist. Like, <laughs> but there's a lot of receivers there. Like, I just think in round two and round three, there is some combination of interior offensive line, running back, receiver, or I don't know. Maybe as crazy as it sounds apparently from everything we get from visits and things they do like Roger McCreary. Maybe they take, if Roger McCreary is there at 57, do they take him? If Booth keeps falling, do they take Booth? Do they double dip? Do they take Kyler Gordon? Do they take whoever? Like there's so many possibilities so for many. what they could do, but I think it comes from one of those buckets to narrow it down. I think it comes yeah. to receiver running back interior offensive line. And then it's just a matter of, who's the best guy out of those position buckets that happens to be available yes. each time. Yes. And then they go and they pull the trigger from there. But overall, you know, Kyrie Elam, he ticks the box of a position of need. He ticks the box from the physical standpoint and the traits yes. standpoint and the toolbox that people have wanted for a corner. And, and, it, and I'm not even just speaking for myself who a lot of people have been clamoring for, like someone who's either bigger or faster or more athletic, give us some traitsy toolsy type of thing. And I've been very much in that boat. And I think Elam is a step towards that. Now it's a question mm-hmm. of how much can you clean them up? How much can you increase his efficiency? How much do you reduce that inconsistency and help him start to raise his floor and reach and or raise his ceiling? What's exciting is he's got a pretty high ceiling like he yes. because of his physical measurables and tools. It's just a matter of can you get that consistency to get him to reach that and then you know allow him to really hone in on what needs to be worked on. But from everything we've heard, again, you're not going to hear negative things in a presser like this like, Bean's not going to come on and be like, well, we really wanted to take someone else or, you know, this kid's a jerk, you know, blah, blah, blah. But from everything we heard and then trying to piece it together, seeing his reaction when he was drafted, he seems like, again, the type of guy, especially with what Bean said, who is committed. He he literally, the verbiage of he's laser focused on being like the best version of himself and doing everything that he can to be great. And it's also easy when you have a really good player at your position in Tredavious White, who's there and you like, you want to be like that guy, like Mm -hmm. especially with how long he's been in the league. Like Trey white is now starting to be one of those dudes that like corners coming into the league are like, Oh my, I want to model my game after exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And like, when you have a dude like that, Terrell Owens with Jerry rice, like he took a shine to Jerry and Jerry took a shine to him. And Terrell Owens is one of the few. It, actually might be like the only who's ever like done the, uh, Jerry's off season workout that Jerry does, which is like legendary and it helped transform Terrell Owens, game. Like you see people who want to emulate that greatness and achieve it and attain it. And the bills have that culture. 
that brings that out in people. Yes. And Elam already seems to have that present inside him, which like yes. you said, I think that was a huge piece that bumped him up into the first round grading area for the bills because of what his potential can be physically. Um, and there, there gotta be their belief in themselves to be like, well, we can mitigate his weaknesses and clean that mm -hmm. up. That's fine. And then you combine that with what he's got going on under the helmet and in between the ears. And it's a really intriguing pick. You know, I've, I've come around a little bit more on it as we've progressed in this off season. Um, but it's going to be a very interesting one. At the very least, they addressed a position in need mm -hmm. on a team that is known for getting the most out of that position grouping. And man, night one is over, about to be over for us as we go pass out. Kendall, any <laughs> parting thoughts, concerns, wishes, where people can find you, poems, maxims, theorems, anything you got before we hit end broadcast and then just literally put our head down and go to sleep? <laughs> No, I hope I hope everyone's feeling well that we we finally got that cornerback. We all we all did our due diligence and got to Brandon Bean's head and we finally got that at the we, we, we cracked too. him. We literally we, we cracked broke him. him. So we should all feel happy about that. Despite, you know, how lukewarm Anthony and I are on the on the tape so far, I, I'm definitely coming around to it. Like the upside is there and and that's what I'm buying into. Brandon Bean has always bought into the idea of upside mm -hmm. and then someone with the character to mm -hmm. actually realize that upside you know Correct. that that's the upside josh isn't allen just about model. the physical you need the mental piece to achieve it exactly and that's the josh allen model you know he had plenty of upside but he was never going to realize it if he never had the determination or the mental side of things to tap into it so not to say that Kyrie Elam is the josh allen of cornerbacks but it's to that vein. And I think we should be excited about that and trust this coaching staff to bet on those traits and trust this coaching staff to come through mm -hmm. on those traits with Kyra Elam. And yeah, I'm excited to see what they do on day two, which is today. <laughs> Correct. We are literally in it. I think it was also something to note uh, as we go here. This is now kind of a track record in first round picks. The Josh Allen, the Gregory Rousseau, the Kyra Elam, mm -hmm. these traitsy toolsy guys with high mm -hmm. ceilings but lower floors yes who if it's like well if you hit on this guy it's a home run or like a triple and maybe more than a double depending it's on a trust you know, more in the priority. organization it's, it's fair and i think this is something to note in terms of what we see going forward like we need to start to drill yeah. home drill in more to that archetype for this team in their first round pick where they like to look for guys who have that mold of you know, they're raw, but they've got this high ceiling, but they want to be frigging great and we can yes. help them do that. So come here mm -hmm. and be the best version of yourselves. The best version of myself right now is going to be the one that's going to go into my bed and go to sleep because I am flat out exhausted. I want to thank everyone who listened to this, download, downloaded, viewed, whatever. We appreciate you guys so much for riding with us on this bonus episode. And if you're listening to this during the day Friday, which I'm anticipating a lot of you are, come back to Disguise Coverage tonight friday at 7 p.m because we will be live for all of night two that's all of round two all of round three it'll be myself and kendall here and several other rotating members of the cover one team and we will have you covered from the very first minute of night two all the way to the very last pick by pick analysis of the bills and every other team scheme fits um traits tools anything and everything, proper prospect evaluation. That's what you get here on the show. And you're going to get it tonight for night two. Shout out to the sponsor, One Pie Pizza. They are the absolute best. The online menu can be found in the episode show notes. I got some last night for night one for Draft Miss because on Draft Miss, it's a celebration and you deserve a present. And my present was One Pie Pizza because they are a gift. They are genuinely good people making genuinely good and i would say great food they are the best pizza in all of buffalo hands down and they make it on homemade blue cheese and it's amazing go check them out again the online menu is in the episode show notes thank you to everybody who tuned in we appreciate you guys more than you know please drop a like on this video i know it's corny but it helps us to track and trend in front of more eyes and ears please rate and review and subscribe whether you're on youtube or any one of the podcasting apps and platforms i hope you and your family and friends and loved ones are all doing well and staying safe we will see you tonight for a live episode of Disguise Coverage at 7 p.m. for night two of the draft. And then Kendall and I will be doing another bonus episode after that to break down the picks on night two. 
So strap in coffees, Red Bulls, whatever you need to do to stay awake, ride with us. We appreciate you guys. And as always, 